Hey guys, Jen from BK here. Another episode of Seen It, and this time you might have seen him on tons of your favorite movies and shows like Oz, Mummy Returns, Thor, Game of Thrones, and recently he is releasing a movie that he is making his directorial debut called Farming. Here's a clip. No farming. Filthy disease. I'm gonna step you out. Did you ever have any dreams of what you wanted to be growing up as a boy, honey? Like PayPal, clean and white. How you doing? You Thank right? you so much. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. It's good to be here. Good to be in New York. I'm trying to keep the vibes up, but after seeing that trailer for mm. Farming, it's just, I got to tell you, it really, it, it brought tears to my eyes. And then learning that the story is actually your story mm -hmm. cut me even deeper. And so I guess let's start there. I'm sorry, a little somber, but still it's a resilient story, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a story of triumph in the end because here I am to tell it. But mm. um, it is my story, uh, but it's also the story of thousands of other Nigerian children. Um, the term uh, and the title of the movie is called Farming. And uh, that was the term used by British social workers to describe a phenomenon that occurred in Britain after the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, whereby the Nigerian immigrants coming to Britain in the 60s um, would foster or farm their children, these are thousands of Nigerian children all over Britain, out to white working class families in order so that they could work and study. With the idea that once they'd uh, earned enough money and graduated, they would then collect their children and return to their native homes. That practice was known as farming. And I was farmed at six weeks old to a white couple in the southeast of England at a time when it was very racially intolerant and we were the only black children in that area. So the film documents my journey under the practice of farming. Uh, when I was watching the trail, <clears throat> I didn't get to see the movie yet, but I will. Um, the part that also really resonated with me was when you, I guess you or your character, or you, mm. was in the front The younger of, version of me. Was in front of the mirror putting all soap on your skin and trying to just rub off, I, I guess, the color of your skin mm. because mm. you were trying to fit in. And that tore me apart because it, it's, as a child, just being farmed, and six weeks old, right? I don't hate to use mm. the word farm, mm. I don't like that. Being sent to another family mm. and having to understand that you are not like the people you live with, mm. that you are different, especially living in an environment and neighborhood that was completely white. Yeah. Is that correct? Totally white, yeah. I mean, how did you deal with that? What were your thoughts during that time? Like, did you know that you, well, something was wrong or off? Well, at six weeks old, you know, the parents that are in front of you are your parents. You have no other re point of reference, so that's your parents, white, black, you know, Asian, whatever. That's, and so my foster parents were white, and they were my parents, and there were about nine or ten other Nigerian children in the house that they were at the time, and we all regarded them as our parents. That's all we knew. Mm -hmm. But um, and they would tell us, you know, you're the same as us. Don't worry. And but every time we would step out the door, we were made very much aware that we weren't the same as them. And you know, if I could just explain, this is like England in the '60s and '70s when we were in an area where they'd never seen black children before. So their Ever. exposure to blacks was what they'd seen on television, whether it was Tarzan or some of the very racial, uh, racist kind of um, sitcoms that were banding around at that time on the BBC. So it was common within the home to even hear racial slurs banded around. And, you know, we'd pick up the jam and there's the gollywog on it. Do you, do you know what I mean? And, and so you go outside and you'd be attacked, you know, bricks thrown at you, you'd be spat on. I've had a dog set on me as a, as, as a young boy. So, you know, this was the environment that we grew up in, and uh, 
it, it really was a, a breeding ground for our own self-hatred because when you don't have um, a positive role model or, or a point of reference, uh, you know, somebody to say you're black and you're beautiful, you begin to identify with the racist and derogatory slurs that are always thrown at you. So the scene that you were referring to was the young version of myself, uh, age uh, eight years old, was trying to scrub off of his skin because he wanted so badly to fit in. And, and that's really what it was like, you know, because anything that could stop the onslaught of racial slurs and attacks is what you wanted to do. And if it meant that taking off the skin would do that as a young boy, then that's what I'll try to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then at a certain point, you know, I used to get beaten up by three or four boys at a time and I'd come home crying, but my father would say, listen, this is how it's going to be for you. Either you go out there and fight them or I'll beat you. And he literally just pushed me out the door, shut the door, and I had to go and fight three or four kids at a time. And what was that like at such a young age? I mean, when did the fighting begin? Since you were like eight well, and yeah, on? All yeah, the since, since that age, yeah. Since about, and, oh and a part of me died, you know, during that process because the child in me had to die, you know, in order to fight back. And, um, but what I do remember is I started at a very young age to get the reputation of the black kid that could not only take a beating but give one back. And then suddenly, Whoop their ass. well, well, <laughs> certainly give I a hope good. You did. Well, yeah, a few of them, <laughs> but certainly, um, you know, it, it made them think about, you know, whether they'd t attack me again. And also, mm -hmm. for the first time in my little life, I was being recognised and acknowledged for something other than my colour. I had a reputation, and then that was a lifeline to me, and I would do anything to keep that coming, whether it was fight and keep pushing them away. Mm -hmm. and, and that brought the notice of the skinheads, you know, that's when they realized, oh, that was a form of amusement initially, but they realized this kid's got, you know, some what we call on the street bottle, like he has some guts. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up being a part of that in the sense that I was a useful tool when fighting rival gangs. Mm -hmm. um, so they would, pretty much recruit you to come and fight with them in these gangs? I mean, these fights they have with other gangs? Or how did that yeah, work? Yeah, I mean, it was a case that they, they and, attacked and me. The skinheads, right? They, these were skinheads that actually wow. lived in the town and ran the town wow. and instilled a lot of fear in the locals. And, and they literally made my life hell. But because I was, you know, forced by my father to stop being the victim and fight back, I think they grew a certain amount of respect for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, part of that gang culture was to fight other rival gangs. Mm -hmm. And I became useful and in, the, in that objective and became part of the gang because of that. But at no point was I ever accepted. I was always yeah, made aware yeah. of who I was and what I was when they were mixing with other white friends. But that reputation um, allowed the other Nigerian children to be able to walk to school without getting beaten. And it stayed some of the racial onslaught, but it was a very f frantic existence in that world because I, I never knew whether the attack was going to come from within or, or outside. So. so you literally had to walk around just feeling having to protect yourself at all times. And you upping still the know ante. Going to happen to you. Absolutely, upping the ante is probably the, the the most incredible acting job I've ever done in my life, which was to survive. You know, and and you know I have to up the ante to keep them at bay. And, and to let them realize that, you know, I was still a formidable presence. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did as a young adolescent. You well, know. I have to tell, commend you because you essentially sacrificed yourself, your well-being physically and mentally to make sure that your people were going to be okay. And that must have been just exhausting. It, it really that. was uh, because there, were, there, there was really nowhere to run. And it wasn't like you could have backup because yeah. you were the only black children there. Yeah. So, you know, I had to, you know, be that pioneer that, that broke down the, sure the, the way for the other guys. But it was at a cost, do you know what I mean? Emotional and psychological. And that's why I had to revisit that in my adulthood to sort of like exercise and, and, and make it a cathartic process for me. This might sound strange, but during your time with the skinheads, mm. um, did you feel, and because you're with them all the time, mm. any form of connection in a sense, meaning that you looked at them differently from within, that maybe these people are just like me, but they were put in a different circumstance? Mm. Like, did that ever cross your mind? Or was it always like, 
these are just some bad MFers that I'm just gonna um, have to hold my own until my people are okay. It was it was more of a case of the, of the latter about okay. holding my own and and, and, and surviving. Yeah. But there was a common uh, connection because you know, in in that you were adolescence and and you know like if if you had a victory in a, in a fight you would share that together and and the thrill and the adrenaline of that that was common among all of us. But you know I was always made aware of what I was, so it really became a case of me just you know, surviving for myself, really, and, and trying to figure a way out of it more than stay in it, you know. Incredible story. Yeah. And you got yourself out of it. How did that happen? How did you leave? Well, you know, uh, things were escalating, you know, um, and my foster parents that had, you know, seven or eight of the other children, aside from myself, you know, it was bringing bad reputation upon her, and she was worried of, that she might lose them. Mm -hmm. And so she called in my biological parents to come and take me out and take me to another family, basically. And that's what, that's what happened. My, my parents had, uh, at that point, um, you know, graduated. My father was a barrister, and so he came out, put me in a, another environment in England. It was kind of like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air in a Sutton, Surrey. <laughs> totally different from the slums that I grew up in. Wow. Manicured lawns and sprinklers. And, I had no way of integrating because, first of all, my dialect was very Cockney for that region, so people couldn't even understand me. And because of what I'd experienced, I, I wasn't able to assimilate. So it was a really difficult transition for me. And they had social workers and tutors and, uh, and put basically an infrastructure around me to study because I was given an ultimatum. Either I made that transition or I would be shipped back to an African village, which I had no knowledge of and no connection to. Yeah. So, um, you know, through, in, in short, I, I did make that transition uh, with the help of several people that really were crucial to help me understand my potential. And um, it's really the passing on my first exam that, that was the pivotal point because up until that point, I'd always thought I was stupid or worthless or, or would not amount to anything. And with uh, application, focus and dedication, I realized that I could do something. That's what that meant. And I've used that blueprint for the success of my life in every sphere, whether it's fashion, acting, writing, and now directing. So that was the turning point, but you know, it, it was not easy. Clearly not. You are truly a survivor at the very least. And again, I have to commend you for that. Just on your psyche, I could just think of myself being put in that situation, just being moved around and having to mm -hmm be a fake and deal with the racism your entire life than being, you know, moved to another home, yeah. which is a total 360 from mm -hmm. what you're used to. It's kind of like your mind's being jumbled around like marbles, like what the hell's going on here? Yeah. Um, did you ever reconnect with your parents after? Your uh, real biological parents? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, <clears throat> and over, you know, obviously, the period that the movie covers is birth to 16. Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, that's like 30 years ago. So right. time is the, is the greatest healer of all. And our, over a pe period of time, I chose to actually go to Nigeria of my own volition to understand my culture on my own terms and, and also get to know them. And, you know, it was never the... Uh, were, you ever, were you mad at them or resented them for doing absolutely. that? Absolutely. In the earlier years, I was very bitter and, and because my pain and, and any time I tried to address it, it was always met with a very dismissive attitude, oh, we did it for you, you were better off. And, uh, but that didn't satiate the hurt and the pain that I had to endure whilst there. And so for me, the only way to sort of process that was to do it creatively, you know what I mean? In the form of writing the screenplay and, and exercising it in a cathartic way, that way. But um, yeah, but over time, you know, we, there was an understanding and I understood the pressures that they were under whilst there. But it was important for me to show them uh, the consequences of their choices and as, as I have done this film, uh, whilst in fact I was in production, there was this huge outpouring in England of other people sharing their experiences of where they were placed and what happened to them. And I felt obligated to honor that in the movie by creating a montage of them. But you know what's happened is the film has created this platform for almost like collective therapy within a community of people that wouldn't otherwise be addressing it. You know, the secret traumas that was caused by this quite uh, abrasive practice, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? So 
it, it's all sort of come full circle in that way. But as I've said, it's not been an easy journey. And, and there's a huge sense of accomplishment now because it's a part of me that's kind of dealt with uh, and in a way that I feel happy with. Well, that's the silver lining in this whole situation yeah. for you, right? If there yeah. is a silver lining. Well, there is because you know why? Ultimately, it's a story of hope. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody, you don't have to have experienced the practice of farming, but it speaks to, you know, triumphing over adversity, mm -hmm. you know, and showing people that no matter where you're from, you know, whatever, however people put you down, there's always a way to overcome that achieve success and happiness. And I think if I was to encapsulate in one word what the film means, it's hope. So there is a silver lining, because I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm happy and accomplished and, and, and good about it. Well, we thank you so much for sharing the story. It's a, it's a movie and a story that needs to be shared now. I mean, the practice doesn't happen now, but- No, no, it doesn't happen anymore. But what's going on with society and just African-Americans in America, and what yeah. they're dealing with, it definitely, it's needed. It's needed. Yeah, there, there are many parallels within that story that, that are very contemporary. You know, it's a, about identity and a sense of belonging and wanting to be accepted. Mm -hmm. And on a national and global level, in England, we're facing a, a national identity crisis yes, with Brexit. And same too. in America, it's you know, we're building insanity. walls and borders. So, you know, there's a lot of things that people can get from this film that are relevant for today. No, we love it. It's already won a ton of awards, and I'm sure it's going to do amazing. We thank you for coming by, Ade. Listen, I can't let you go, though, yet, because, mm. sir, your entire resume, it's like pages and pages long. And, of course, I have to talk about the incredible show, Oz. Like, mm. whoa, mm. your character, Simon at a BC, yeah. everyone knows and loves, and you you really brought that character to life. Like, it, it wasn't just about a show of people mm -hmm. being in jail and like, you see what happens in the ins and outs. Like, you were just this badass guy, <laughs> would not let anyone mess with you. So, yeah. how was that experience working on Oz? And I was devastated when you died. Mm. Like, I heard, I read that you left because of The Mummy Returns. You had to go film that? Yeah, that and, you off? and, well, I, I asked to be written off because, oh, okay. um, you know, I did want to explore uh, film. Damn, you were so good, we I, love Listen, <laughs> I, I, I got to be honest, that I really enjoyed playing him because, yeah. you know, first of all, it's such a great uh, collection of actors, yes. you know what Incredible I mean? Show. Um, and, and, the, and the producer and the creator, Tom Fontana, mm -hmm. you know, he just gave me so much creative freedom to, you know, invent that character. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, like I said, the energy of New York w infused me, you know, because you just got to be real. Yeah. And um, it was just a brilliant time for me to exercise my, my acting chops and I, I just went with it. I was so fearless and you know you anytime are. you come to New York <laughs> that that's you know that's what they call me and that's who I'll always be because you know I feel like it's a character that belongs to New York at a BC you know what I mean it does yeah. did you go into like jails and prisons to kind of get into character or was it just <laughs> like you just no. recall <laughs> your early days of fighting and being aggressive and just put it into the character no, I, I'd, I'd had a, um, how could I say, a, a resourceful and a rich up, upbringing <laughs> in childhood. So, you know, when they said action, I had plenty. Uh -huh. And, uh, the, you know, I, I could tap into certain things or, or even vicariously, things that I've witnessed. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm a great observer and I've been around, you know, people that have been in life-threatening situations yep. and as an as a adolescent. So I was able to just, like, tune in. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Ultimately, the space as well. When you get like, you know, 300 extras in a, you know, male extras in, in this room, it's going to bring it out, man. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, that yeah. feral kind of, you know, um, energy of, of competitiveness. It's yeah. just, that's what you do, man. It's top dog. Yeah, and for it's sure. Like, and but Tom created this environment that if you weren't good enough, if you weren't chopping the scenes, you'd get killed. Oh. So everybody had to just step up and because you didn't know That's whether you were going to be in it next it? week. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it was a great, healthy environment. Well, you guys brought it and said, yeah. did you wrong? I just want to let you know that for sure. <laughs> uh, but since then, you've also done a million other films. You, you are a natural and Bless I guess you. a recurring person when it comes to big blockbuster films and superhero type films, right? Mm, mm. So you were in Suicide Squad, yeah, you were yeah. also in Thor. So do you enjoy taking on roles like that? Yeah, I think as a kid, you know, those are things that, you know, I, I, you know, if you see, you know, 
I think back then it was Star Wars and Superman because it wasn't all Marvel then when I was right. a kid. But those are worlds that as a kid you always want to inhibit because it's like fantasy, you know what I mean? And so who wouldn't want to be a part of that and be able to play some you know, character where you can transform yourself. I think in, in Thor, I play two characters. Uh -huh. So it, it's just great to do. And, uh, you know, and then in G.I. Joe was different in, in Suicide Squad with all the makeup. So mm -hmm. to be able to transform and, and, and uh, disappear from who I am and, and make that believable for the audience is really what turns me on as an actor. So I love those worlds uh, as well as I love the real nitty gritty worlds as well. Who's your favorite superhero? has to be Panther, man. He represents the, the black people, man. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mean, you know, they are feeling Black Panther 2, maybe Black Panther 3. I mean, you know, hey, you listen. step up in there. Hey, listen, I'm good where I'm at, but you know what? <laughs> I'm just happy that it's, it's, it's out there because I think it's empowering for our people to see our images on the big screen and, and with so much diversity and beauty. So We love it. You know what I mean? And finally, there's you've been done a ton of things. I can go on and on and on, right? So I, I have to ask you, you were on one of my favorite shows of all time, besides Oz, Game of Thrones. Okay. It was a small role as Malco, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But just being in that, in the presence of like, just on the set of an iconic show like that, and that scene made me uncomfortable, I'm not gonna lie, because the C word, was used quite often because mm. we were talking about Peter Tinklage yeah. and it was being sold off. Right, um, right, right, right. <laughs> so uh, I, how, how was I filming that and being on Game of Thrones? You know what? It, it was a favor to a producer that I worked really? with. And that, yeah, yeah, it was just like a little cameo when he'd ask would I pop on it. But and you got the connects, huh? Well, you cameo, know what? I've been, in, I've, been in, I've been in the game for a minute. So, um, <laughs> and, and they needed a slot and they said, would, and it, it, was, it was a funny scene to, to be, you know, a slave catcher that, you know, prizes, you know, phalluses uh, of, of midgets as a, as a treasure. Yeah, so, they said so, it was like gold or something, right? Yeah, you get a lot of money for a midget, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I thought that was fun. And, um, you know, I'd worked with uh, Kit uh, Harrington on, on Pompeii. So, you know, there's a, there's a couple of actors, and I think Peter is a brilliant actor on there. So. It just worked out, and it was shooting in Croatia, and I said I could do it with a holiday and just pop in and, you know, throw the audience off a little bit, and that's that's what it did. You also co-starred along. Well, you were also in the film Concussion alongside Will Smith. Yeah, yeah, it's a very important film. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just what's your take on that? Well, I mean, the reason I, I you know, became a part of it, first of all, it was a Nigerian doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm obviously in Nigerian heritage, so I was very proud of this gentleman that would brought this disease to, you know, the spotlight. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, look, it, 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 it's, it's a real occurring thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it was important for us to show that so that people, it's not that you stop playing football, but you, you are fully aware of the, you know, possible consequences of doing that. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, the, um, the NFL or whoever can, be mindful of that and see from you know what we're showing that okay we can put in checks and balances to prevent stuff you know so mm -hmm. take some proactive measures as opposed to reactive ones when it's too late but you know that's why we did the film i'm not sure if you can answer this uh, if you're uncomfortable i mean please don't but um with what's going on with Colin Kaepernick and mm. the NFL right now, mm. and it kind of ties back to what you endured growing up, right? The race, the racism. Mm. Um, do you still watch and support NFL? I mean, the football. Is that how, what? How do you feel about mm. I, the I gotta, whole situation with with that? Listen, I got to be honest with you. Be um, real. Be yeah, honest. yeah. I mean, listen. I mean, let us know. I'll be real. I don't even watch football. Oh, <laughs> so you have a game? No, I'm. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, fr I'm from England and I, I like <laughs> soccer. Does so, that make you mad that we call it football here? And yeah, football it, it really does. Really soccer. I mean, that's, 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 if I'm being honest, I don't even watch it. So I don't really get caught up in the politics because I don't watch it. Okay. Maybe an event game I, I might tune in, but gotcha. soccer's my thing. But in terms of somebody standing up for what they believe, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I have to endorse that, you know, because integrity is, is the key in life. So if that's, that's right. what a person believes, they, they got to go with it. Hello. Well, we believe in you, and we can't wait to watch the film. <laughs> Thank you.
farming. Addy, again, thank you so much for thank stopping so by. Thank you so much. We're going to wrap this up with the game, though. Oh, oh, there's more. Okay. There's this. It's my little movie taboo game called Jembu. Okay? Jembu. Yes. Right. Taboo Jembu. So what's going to happen is you're going to see a movie on the screen. We're going to play it for you. Okay. But you can't say any of the words that are on the screen. And I have to guess what the film is. You All right. Can you handle it? Uh, I'll give it a go. <laughs> you got 30 seconds. That's it. You're going to give me some clues, right? Right. All right but cool. uh, but you're going to do it too. All right. But you can't say what's on the screen, though. Okay. There's going to be words that you can't use. You got oh, it? Okay. I'm very competitive, so I'm just letting you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Bring in the laptop. We're going to do okay, this. Okay. We're going to do this for real. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, shoot, all right, uh, shoot. driving, lots of driving in this film, um, uh, um, it's Fast and Furious. Yes! Woo! That's what, that's right, that's like, that's like, what, 10, ten seconds. seconds. Right, cool. Ten seconds, ten right, seconds. Cool. All right, okay, not looking, not looking, this is very difficult. I'd be terrible on set, wouldn't I? Can we? Break that. Huh? Can we? Okay. <laughs> I said lots of driving. That's all it took. That's all it took. No, but you are an OG in this, so you don't know everything I say. See. I'm Let's sure you've see. seen a ton of movies. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Let's see. Ready? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Uh, a, a, a superhero. Um, he, he, this guy played one of the roles and he passed away. He almost won an Oscar Dead for group? it. No. Oh, uh, oh, with, Superman. With, no, it's another person. He, he hmm? comes out at night. Oh, He's similar man. to an animal oh, man. that flies Batman? in. Yeah, yes, but that, the, uh, the different versions of it, the one that just came out not too long ago. Oh, God, Dark Knight? Yes! Oh. <laughs> Oh. Five seconds. Well, one second left. We have one second, Chris. Look at She's that. I am. I am. Okay. Damn. Did uh, you? I mean, you got though in the in the end. Yeah, we got there in the uh, end. Like okay. one second left. One second left. Uh, Will Smith. Fresh Prince um, of Bel Air. No. Bad Boys. No. No. Men in Black. It's lots of things <laughs> coming down from another world. Uh, 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 AI. Uh, uh, no, it's oh, oh, Christ! But you can't say the actor's name. I'm sure it says that there. No, it doesn't. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, yes, it does. <laughs> uh, all right. So what the film? He's, Enemy of the State. No, oh, uh, he's close. Uh, uh, but it, he's he's, it's, uh, he's very free and he does what he likes. Oh God! It, it's uh, almost like the name of a song that um, what's his name did. Shoot, um, shoot! I just saw this the other day. Oh my God! It's like how we like women to be. Um, uh, uh, they, uh, Independent woman. Independent. <laughs> Addy does not look promising. Come on, come um, on. So it's it's going really fast, and it's all about going really fast, and it begins okay. with um, S and um, Superman. No, but it's all about oh, it's, uh, uh, driving people in a in a vehicle. Okay, and, uh, a spaceship, I think something. Sandra Bullock's in there. Oh, oh, Mikey. oh, oh, nice. oh eh. are we done anyway? Oh. I messed well, what, up. What was I'm it? Good at this. What, what? Speed, look, oh. he got that. I'm like driving really fast. Driving people in a vehicle. In a vehicle. <laughs> when you said Sandra Bullock, I mean that's when it went off. Oh, <laughs> damn, speed. Oh, boy, oh, oh, it's I one lost. of my favorite movies too. I lost. It's all right, Addy. Listen, oh, it's you. Such a yeah. <laughs> Ada, you can't win everything, right? Yeah. Not in Jenbu, but you can win in life and in theaters. And we cannot wait to see farming. There you go. This, this part is when I have my guests just do a quick 10 second, 15 second elevator pitch to the people out there why you need to see farming. So uh, go right ahead. Um, you need to see farming because uh, it's what I call edutainment. It will educate you about an unknown phenomenon, but it will entertain you to the nth degree. Dramatic, Dams and Idris, Kate Beckinsale, Gugu and Bertha Roar, and the story is directed by your one and only Adabisi. And it's all about me. Go see it. That's it. That's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>